Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy that you uh, joined us again for the afternoon session where we're going to talk about climate change mitigation through soil health and integrating local to global initiatives. And we really are talking about how to deal with the scaling component of carbon quantification. And, you know, not just scaling in, in space, but scaling across different entities and institutions. So I think it will be very informative for everyone that, that uh, hangs on for the whole two hours. Uh, we have a great group of speakers. We have those representing SHI or science, scientists, uh, international uh, groups, NRCS, and also um, corporate, uh, corporate work. And Jason is saying his camera doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, don't worry, Jason, as long as you can share your talk, you'll be all right. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Jason Ackerson, and his camera is not working, but I think that should be okay. As long as I don't have to give your talk, Jason, I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> okay, at least your, at least your, uh, your, your microphone is working. Dr. Ackerson is a research soil scientist at SHI working on soil carbon measurement and technology discovery. He previously served as an assistant professor and extension specialist in the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University. His research focused on developing proximal sensors to quantify soil properties and enhance digital soil mapping. And so essentially, it's a lot of what he still does at SHI. Uh, we, he's very good at looking at spatial scale and integrating sensors, integrating multiple scales, and really a good thinker about how to integrate soil science in with technology. Um, with that, Jason, you can uh, go ahead and share your presentation and start talking. All right, your presentation's up, so that part's good. <laughs> oh, thankfully. Uh, it's always embarrassing to be introduced to someone who's good with technology and then have technology issues in your talk. So sorry about the, the camera issues, folks. Um, as Christine mentioned, a lot of the work I do here at SHI focuses on assessing soil carbon and thinking about ways of, of measuring soil carbon. And a lot of that thinking over the last year has focused kind of a, a lot about the, the topic of SHI's whole conference this week, which is scaling. Think about how to bring these measurements to scale. Um, and one of the challenges with, with soil carbon and measuring soil carbon quickly is that um, there can be a lot of variability in soil carbon across different regions and soil types. So what we're looking at on this first graph is uh, bar plots of soil organic carbon stocks for sort of what we would think of as the highest achievable soil carbon stocks in the black bars and stocks measured in row crops in the lighter bars. And this is work done by my colleague, Nate Looker. Um, so sorry to steal your, your work here, Nate, but I think it's a really good illustration of challenge with measuring soil carbon stocks, which is there's a big variability in how much carbon soils can store, not only between soil types, so we're looking at soils based on their textural groups, medium versus fine here, um, but also across regions. So you can look at the difference between these bars, the dark bar and the light bar as being the amount of carbon we could potentially add in to row crop soils. And the critical piece here is that that gap that amount of carbon that could be stored in different soils is dependent on the soil type in the region. So any way of measuring that carbon needs to account for that variability because it critically drives sort of what the potential carbon stocks could be or what they actually are in any given point in time. So uh, this really brings up some of the key challenges for soil organic carbon stock measurements, um, particularly when we're thinking about developing soil carbon markets um, is that these measurements need to be rigorous and reproducible, but they should also support multiple outcomes, right? Often we see measure and modeled approaches being used in conjunction for carbon marketing. So stock data needs to support multiple outcomes. And like we showed in the last slide, these stocks need to account for the inherent variability, soil organic carbon stock potential or variability in soils. Um, and lastly, I think this is the piece that's often been um, misunder or underrepresented really, is these measurements need to be scalable. Uh, we need to really have measurements that are viable, not for um, maybe hundreds or thousands of acres, but hundreds of thousands of acres or millions of acres. So a traditional approach for measuring uh, soil carbon stocks 
really focus on the sort of field scale sampling. This is what I think of as sampling from the farmer's perspective, which is really trying to answer the question, what is the sole carbon stock of this particular field? So really common approach, and the one we'll, we'll kind of use as our example in today's discussion is a field level stratified random sampling design. So the background map you're looking at here is USDA Sergo soil map. And what we might do in a field like this is uh, allocate certain amounts of points to those various soil types and measure the stock of each soil type. So we've got a stock for the blue soil, calling soil one, stock for the green soil, which we're calling soil two. We would measure each of these stocks for all of the soils in a field and get an estimate of what the, the stock for each soil type in a field would be. Then to get the stock for the entire field, uh, we would just calculate a weighted average of those stocks. So we would weight um, each of those stocks for each soil type by the area of the field. Um, this is a pretty common approach and pretty well implemented in most sampling places, sampling designs. So a lot of these soil sampling methodologies, CAR or VERA sort of implement or, or try to suggest a sampling design quite similar to this. Um, it's a, it's a well-established protocol, has a high degree of accuracy and rigor. Um, it's typical of what uh, soil samplers or professional soil samplers are doing. So it's relatively easy to implement. Um, and the critical piece here is that the sample number depends on two factors, the number of soil strata, but largely the size of the field. So the more soil types you have, the more samples you will need, the larger the field, the more samples you'll need. And this gets to the sort of main constraint of field level sampling is that it can be really expensive and hard to scale. It has a, a high requirement for sample numbers. So that makes it really, really costly when we think about sampling, not one field, but hundreds of fields. And this sort of brings us to the uh, maybe an alternative way of thinking about sampling soil carbon stocks, which is the, the method we've been sort of experimenting with SHI uh, and our partners at TruTerra, which is a regional scale soil sampling approach. So this is sort of uh, zooming out from the individual field and instead of asking the question, what's the stock of this field? We're asking the question, what's the stock of a farm or a collection of fields? Or uh, also thinking about what's the stock of a watershed or a conservation district? And I like to think about this as sampling from the project perspective. Instead of focusing on one field at a time, we're focusing on as many fields as we can, we can look at um, in a region. This brings up a couple questions about the validity of the sampling approach and, and challenges to scaling it. Um, particularly, the first question we're interested in is, is this stratification approach accurate enough for carbon marketing? Do we get good enough data from a regional scale approach? And lastly, is it cost effective? Is it more cost effective than that high resolution field scale sampling? So to kind of walk you through an example of what a regional scale sampling approach would look like, and this is going to look really similar to what we did at the field scale. So we're going to take a collection of fields. And now instead of allocating points randomly within fields, we allocate them across multiple fields within the same soil type or same soil strata. So here the black dots represent samples uh, for the blue soil, which are calling soil one in this case. We collect a second set of samples for uh, the stock for soil two, the green soil. And we do this for each of the soil strata within the region here. And we're allocating them now instead of within fields uh, across multiple fields. So just like with our field scale sampling, we can use an area weighted average to calculate carbon stocks, but now we can look at them for an entire region or individual fields using that same uh, weighted average approach. Now this gives us a really high spatial coverage, we're covering multiple fields in a region, but it comes at a lower accuracy because we're not sampling each field in as high a detail. Critically though, the sample number um, or which relates to cost depends only on the number of sample strata we're looking at. So as long as all of our fields are in the same management regime, we can look, we can potentially reduce our sample number by looking at smaller numbers of samples. And this leads to sort of a couple of the key challenges to regional stratification. Firstly, all the fields need to be under similar management. So similar cropping history, similar implementation of soil health management practices. Uh, they need to be relatively uniform for this sort of trick to work. And also we need to think about how we can leverage uh, ways of grouping soils to minimize our sample number. 
um, if we use soil survey map units, so from the Sergo database, we would have too many sample strata to make this uh, sampling approach really viable. So you can think about a typical county has 100 to 150 map units. So we would still need uh, thousands and thousands of sample support stratification on the map unit basis. So the approach that we've adopted at SHI is to combine soils with similar soil organic carbon storage capacity with the sampling strata. And I won't get into the details of the stratification approach too much, but we've grouped them using two classes or two main factors, their texture. Uh, we have six textural classes we're grouping by and four drainage classes we're grouping by. And these are all based off of USDA soil survey data. Um, and so we have a six by four, so 24 different strata within a region. So to kind of test and compare these two strategies, strategies um, in conjunction with Truterra, we ran a, a case study in the region outlined in blue here. This is the major land resource area 107B, which occupies a good portion of Western Iowa. And we did two stratification tests here, a field level stratification on nine fields where we stratified those fields based on their Sergo map unit. And to kind of constrain the exercise, we instituted a couple small rules. We wanted one sample for every five acres, minimum sample density. And then within each field, we wanted a minimum of three samples per map unit, which gave us 335 total samples with the average intensity of 37.2 samples per field. On the regional scale side, we actually sampled 49 fields broken, broken across eight sampling strata. So we had four of our soil strata represented and two management regimes across that landscape. So four by two gives us eight sampling strata. We targeted 50 samples per strata, which gave us a approximate uh, 8.3 samples per field on average as a sample intensity. So based on those two approaches, for each of our nine fields where we have field level stocks, we estimated the stocks using our regional sampling approach and our field level sampling approach. So the graph you're looking at here represents the stocks and the stock uncertainties for each of those nine fields. The blue dots and lines represent stocks estimated using the regional scale approach, and the red dots and lines represent the field scale sampling approach. So you can think of the blue as the sort of innovative, new, larger regional perspective. The red is the tried and true, um, well, well constructed, well thought out. Um, well, they're both well constructed and well thought out, but it's the well established method. Um, so the key takeaways here are sort of two pieces. The first is that we have a pretty good correlation between our regional scale stocks and our field scale stocks. Pearson's correlation coefficient here is around 0.67 um, between these two stocks. The second thing to take away is that the height of those bars, which represents the uncertainty in each of those estimates, is larger for all of the blue lines. So the regional scale stocks do end up with a lower uncertainty. Right? We're not sampling each field with as much intensity, so we don't get as a precise of an estimate. And this comes with a trade off. So, what we're looking at on this slide here is bar plots, or excuse me, box plots of the stock uncertainty for each of our sampling approaches. On the left is the field scale sampling results, and on the right is the regional scale sampling results. So, here, the, the higher the number, the less accurate our estimate of those stocks are. So that you can see field scale stocks have a much a lower level of uncertainty versus the regional scale stocks. That's on average is about 62% lower for a field scale estimate. But there's an important trade-off here in that those regional scale stocks um, are gen generated using a much lower sample intensity. So if we look back, think back to our initial sampling design, we had roughly 37 samples in each field for the field scale stocks, but only eight samples per field in the regional scale stocks. This means that that lower uncertainty for field scale stocks comes at a much higher sample intensity. It's almost 400% higher per field. So there's a trade-off here between number of samples and estimate uncertainty. So to kind of wrap things up, thinking about strategies to bring soil carbon markets to scale really requires careful consideration of how we're gonna think about soil sampling and adopt various sampling approaches. Um, and to that end, field and regional scale sampling approaches uh, need to be both viable. Um, they can both be viable, but they need to have uh, careful consideration of their trade-offs. 
right? Field scale stocks are really accurate. They're the sort of gold standard, but they're really expensive. And so we need to think about um, at a project level or a market level, what's the right trade-off between that sample cost and accuracy? I mean, this is where marketplaces, verifiers, and project developers all need to kind of coordinate on what the right uh, level of accuracy needed for marketplaces is. I think that's the end of my, my slide deck. All right, thanks, Jason. We have a couple of good questions to see how many we can get through here. Uh, the first question, Jason, is from Matt Relaford and a couple of other people. A lot of carbon markets have focused on relatively simple cropping systems, corn, soy, maybe small grains. How would a regional soil sample system work on a cropping system that may have four to eight crops that rotate through them? Can the same approach work or does the increased number of crops make it a much more difficult to establish validity? Oof. Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I'm gonna do the like classic, you know, academic responses. Like, I think it depends. I think the answer to both those questions is really yes. We could implement this approach, but we need really careful consideration of the timing of sampling relative to those crop rotations. So when we have those really complicated crop rotations, we need to make sure that sampling efforts are aligned with crop rotations so that we have, you know, we're sampling strata within the similar part of the rotation across fields. But I think it can work. I think it's just a matter of really focusing on the data and having good management history to align those, those sampling efforts too. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's a tricky, tricky answer. Yeah. Okay, the next question is from Alyssa Whitecraft, Whitcraft. A question on, this is a great one too, a question on the field scale stratification using Sergo. I recall Sergo advising specifically against using their data at field scale or finer, if I'm indeed recalling correctly, which she is. Did you find that using Sergo in this way demonstrated fidelity of that product or field skill sampling, or did you find that Sergo classes were not reliable at that scale? Take it away, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another really good question. Yeah, I think um, if you yeah if you dig into the literature around Sergo, right, everything says at the field scale you really need to be cautious about using Sergo because it was never intended to be looked at as a precision product. And that is 100% true. Um, the reality is it's often the best we have at this point. And so you see it being implemented in the industry, whether it's the right approach or not. Um, our results have shown that we can detect significant differences between carbon stocks across map units within a field. So you know, with the data we have, we do see differences in carbon stocks between each of the map units that we've sampled. That gives us a good idea that it's at least a good starting point. I think the the ultimate challenge here, right, is is until we have really really high resolution validated soil maps, um, we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to use this approach with as much certainty as we'd like. Um, it's a, all about trade offs here. Yeah, um, but it's a good reason to keep the NRCS employed. We need better yeah. maps, guys. Yeah. And I'll add to that, we also had a few safety belts, right? Like one was that we used, um, we also collected the soil texture at, at the site using spectroscopy so that we could validate that we sampled what we thought we were sampling or at least somewhat validate it. And is that right, Jason? And then also, uh, did you also in, use Polaris in this particular project? Yeah, so we, we you know, we I presented a simplified version of our stratification here. It was like a four-way stratification with Polaris and digital elevation models. We tried all sorts of weird things. The reality is like Sergo does work pretty well. It's actually a pretty good product. And I think a lot of those caveats are really a lot of bet hedging on the, the part of NRCS because they, they have made a pretty good map. All right, great. I'm sure our NRCS folks on the panel are happy to hear that. Um, always, always happy to pad the NRCS egos. Yeah, At, well, it's a good product and it's quality and it and it really integrates so much uh, valuable information by career soil scientists, right? That know the landscape and have studied it. It's it's a pretty amazing product. Um, okay, next question. 
Oh, this is a good one. Do you expect protocols such as Vera or B-Carbon to adopt the regional sampling? I'd like to see it, or at least have those options laid out within those protocols. I think, you know, if we really want carbon markets to function at scale, product developers or, or project managers really need to have the flexibility to implement multiple approaches um, or varying approaches, depending on the rigor that's needed for that that sampling approach. I think, I think what we're we're hopefully we'll see in the next coming years is a. a a relaxation of some of those requirements so that we can adopt maybe more innovation in the sampling space. Okay. We still have time, so we're going. Jason, do you think, oh, and it just disappeared on me. Okay. Oh, can you distinguish soil organic carbon that is liable and rapidly decomposing to CO2 from the more persistent longer duration carbon? Certainly, there are methods where people are looking at that, thinking about you know fractionating carbon into mineral associated carbon versus you know more more uh, labile for for lack of a better term um, carbon compounds. We haven't looked at that in this particular um, exercise. And to, to my knowledge, no one in the carbon marketing space is particularly interested in that. They're looking at bulk carbon or soil organic carbon, um, but certainly if we want to think about the permanence of carbon there needs to be a lot more research on the, the various carbon pools and how mobile they are because that that will certainly affect the the, the benefit to um, sequestration that that carbon would, would pose okay all right thanks jason and jason just so you know there are a lot of questions in this q a and you're very welcome to go in and type out answers to them as, as you see fit. Uh, that's the same for all of our panelists. Um, all right, thanks, Jason, appreciate that.